All right, so we're going to kick off with this presentation. So we start with a presentation from our guests, and then we have a whole panel of panelists ready to uh, comment and react and tell us what they think about online, global online speech norms. Um, so our two guests are Kate Klonick, who is an assistant professor at St. John's University Law School, a fellow at Yale's Information Society Project. She holds a JD from Georgetown University and a PhD from Yale Law School. Recently, Kate has published a well-known paper on the Harvard Law Review, uh, which we all draw inspiration from, entitled The New Governors, The People, Rules, and Processes Governing Online Speech. More recently, she's been co-authoring another paper uh, together with Thomas Kadri that they are going to introduce and talk about in their presentation. Thomas Kadri is a PhD candidate at Yale Law School uh, with a JD from Michigan Law School and an MA from University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He has interests that span very widely in free speech, privacy, property, torts, criminal law, and the internet. Um, and so I will let them kick off with their presentation. Great. Thank you. Uh, everyone hear me okay? Are the mics working? Great. Um, oh. One more thing is uh, this event is being live, uh, live cast. So if you need to intervene or ask questions, just bear that in mind. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Lester, for having us uh, and to the Berkman Klein Center. We're really, really delighted to be here to talk to you about our paper, Facebook v. Sullivan, Building Constitutional Law for Online Speech. Um, so in the lead up to the last presidential election, uh, you may remember that there was a, a big kerfuffle in the news about some statements that then candidate uh, Donald Trump was making about his proposed Muslim ban. And uh, this was obviously big news uh, across the country, but it was also big news within Facebook. And that's because, uh, plausibly at least, uh, the, the, the words that Trump was saying, uh, these statements that he was making about his desire to have a, a Muslim ban, uh, plausibly violated some of Facebook's own internal rules. And some people within the company were upset about this. They thought, why is it that Donald Trump gets to say these things when if somebody else said them, uh, they would come down, uh, they would be flagged, and they would be removed under Facebook's internal rules. And in addressing why it was that the company decided to keep this, uh, these, these uh, uh, statements that Trump had made up on the platform, Zuckerberg uh, explained it in terms that were quite reminiscent of First Amendment law, for those of you who are familiar with certain First Amendment concepts. He was saying that you know, Trump is a public figure, obviously, right? He's running for the highest political office in the land. Uh, and they were saying that the, uh, the content of his, of his words were newsworthy. This is a public policy pronouncement that he's making. It's a huge part of his platform for president. And he was using Facebook as a way to get that message out. And so as perhaps hateful and divisive uh, and cruel as some of his comments were, uh, it was newsworthy. It was in the public interest and Trump as a public figure got to have his words stay up on the platform. And there were a lot of people who were really upset about that, both within the company and outside of it. So why do we start with this anecdote? We start with it because it tells us something really quite interesting about the dynamics of online speech today. And that is that it's no longer the case that the body that is responsible for adjudicating competing claims about harmful speech uh, are these old governors that we know so well, the sort of courts that maybe are applying First Amendment law and First Amendment principles to torts such as privacy, defamation, intentional infliction of emotional distress, the so-called sort of communications torts. Uh, there's, a new, there's a new player in town, um, as Kate so wonderfully coined, the new governors. And so what this paper attempts to do, at least, is to uh, unpack a little bit how it is that these new governors are borrowing, being inspired by, building off of, riffing off uh, these concepts that have been developed over many, many years by the old governors, by the courts. And so what we try and do first uh, in our paper is to uh, tell a story about the development of the jurisprudence in this area, uh, mostly through Supreme Court cases, but sometimes not so much, uh, all around these two uh, ideas that came up in, in the initial Trump question, uh, newsworthiness and public figures. When is it that special consideration should be made about speech because it maybe concerns a public figure or it's made by a public figure or the underlying content of the speech 
is newsworthy. And by drawing out some of the jurisprudence in this area in the courts, and then doing a really great deep dive into, uh, into what Facebook is doing in this area um, because of some wonderful empirical research that, that Kate had done uh, and interviews that she had done with people inside, inside the platforms, uh, we were able to do something of a comparative analysis and say, okay, well, here are some of the ways in which uh, this is really similar, and here are some of the ways in which it's different, and here are some of the lessons that we can maybe learn from those similarities and differences. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, some of those lessons that we draw out of it, uh, there is at least perhaps a, a partial response to some of the concerns that we have uh, in the form of a new oversight board that you may have heard about, this so-called Supreme Court of Facebook, uh, or the Facebook Oversight Board, uh, which uh, should go into, into action sometime later this year and will serve as a, an overview board for decisions about what content can and can't be on the platform. So in the future, if uh, you know, uh, President Trump, when he's on the campaign trail uh, next year, uh, when he makes similar statements, it won't just be, perhaps, it won't just be up to uh, Mark Zuckerberg or other high-level policymakers to make those decisions behind closed doors. We may actually have some sort of formal oversight process uh, and a bit of transparency about that. So we go into a little bit of that in the paper. So I'm going to kick off by just talking a little bit about some of the First Amendment issues that are at play here, just to give a little bit of a, a primer on that um, for those who aren't familiar with some of the cases. And then Kate's going to talk a little bit about what's going on at Facebook. We'll draw out some lessons from that and then finish, if we have time, with a little bit of uh, comment about, about this oversight board. Um, yeah, thanks. So, um, so this is a, uh, uh, the, the ad that was at issue in the famous path-breaking First Amendment case, New York Times versus Sullivan. Um, and uh, this is really a starting point for us, not only the pun in our title, but a really inspirational uh, case that really is, is foundational in First Amendment law. And we won't go into all of the details here. Many of you, I'm sure, will have already be familiar with the case, and you can go read it. But, but the main point to kind of take away from it is that the Supreme Court, in trying to understand the limits of defamation, so when you can have liability for saying false things about a public figure, uh, drew some constitutional lines. It said, because of the potential chilling effect that it could have on free speech, if you're allowed broad liability for defamation, uh, about statements you make about public figures, we're going to craft this constitutional rule, we're gonna set this sort of constitutional balance, and we're gonna say that if you're going to win your defamation claim as a public figure, you need to show actual malice, which basically means that you knew that what you were saying was false, or you said it with a reckless disregard for whether it was false or not. And in order to allow space, breathing space, for the First Amendment, we're gonna set special rules around public figures and public officials. Uh, and then, outside of the defamation context, if we go to next slide, uh, we have, uh, this is, this is uh, from the famous case Time v. Hill, which is not a defamation case, even though sometimes it sounds like one, it's actually a false light privacy case. Um, and similarly in this realm, the court said, well, like in New York Times versus Sullivan, these privacy torts, they have the potential to chill free speech quite a lot, and we need to craft certain rules around, to give, give a bit of breathing room for, for speakers to be able to make mistakes or to, uh, to, to err uh, for the sake of the First Amendment. Uh, but here they stuck a, a slightly different balance, right? They didn't say that it matters whether the plaintiff is a public figure or not, they toyed with that idea, but instead they said, no, what matters is that the underlying speech is on a matter of public concern. It is newsworthy. Uh, quite what that means, we go into a little more in the, in the, in the paper, but you know, this is where some of these concepts come from. If we do next slide. Here is Terry Bollea, or Hulk Hogan. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the rather famous case that he brought a few years ago against Gawker, which led to Gawker's demise. Uh, and this was a, a, another privacy tort. This was public disclosure of private facts. And there, like in the false light case of Hill, the court sort of says, well, yeah, there's, there are First Amendment concerns here, and we need to be able to protect speech that are on legitimate matters of public concern, or again, that are newsworthy, in order to allow the breathing space for the First Amendment. And then we go to the next slide. Uh, the third and final privacy tort that we look at outside of defamation and privacy is intentional infliction of emotional distress. So this is the famous Campari parody ad about Jerry Falwell, um, about a time when he was in an outhouse with his mother. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you know, he sued and said, this, uh, this is so cruel, this is such a, a horrible ad for you to put up here, uh, and I have suffered severe emotional distress as a result. And the court said, well, that may be true, but in order to allow the First Amendment the space that it needs, we're going to craft these rules again. And here, the court drew one on the public figure, private figure line. It said that Falwell's a public figure and we need room to be able to talk about these people. Um, but then if we go to the next slide, uh, 
only, gosh, I can't remember how many years ago now, maybe eight years ago, I guess, Snyder v. Phelps. Uh, this was the case of the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, who picketed outside of a, a soldier's funeral um, with some absolutely abysmal and horrific signs. Uh, and the father of the, the slain soldier uh, sued and said, like Falwell, well, you have inflicted severe emotional distress on me, and I should be able to reclaim damages for that. And the court said, we, we understand that this is something that has caused you this distress, yet nonetheless, the values and the principles of free speech that are enshrined in the First Amendment require that we say, no, this is speech on a matter of public concern done in a public place, and therefore, unfortunately, you cannot reclaim damages, or you cannot claim damages, even though we accept that this was harmful speech, this was speech that really harmed you. So this is the kind of backdrop of the, the jurisprudence that laid the foundation, uh, we argue, for some of the decisions that Facebook made using these similar terms, public figures and, and newsworthiness. So I'm going to kind of take you into why are we talking about uh, the Supreme Court's decision in the First Amendment. And this brings us to the second way that we describe, that Thomas described earlier of taking down speech that we don't like about us uh, through private systems like Facebook's content moderation system, which didn't develop in a vacuum. And instead in developing in American tech companies in Silicon Valley, uh, the, it developed with a lot of the same types of concepts and exceptions uh, that the court created in um, creating their First Amendment limits to tort liability in cases involving public figures and matters of public concern. So whereas the court's um, public figure doctrine do out of, drew, uh, grew out of claims of defamation, Facebook's concepts of public figures actually emerged from claims of bullying. In 2009, Facebook was facing heavy pressure from anti-cyberbullying advocacy groups to do more to prevent kids from being bullied online. The problem, however, was that the traditional academic definition of bullying seemed impossible to translate to, the online, con to online content moderation. How do we write a rule about bullying, recounts one of the original authors of these policies at Facebook. What is bullying? What do you mean by that? It's not just things that are upsetting. It's defined as a pattern of abusive or harassing unwanted behavior over time that is occurring between a higher power and a lower power. And that's not an answer to the problem that resides in the content. You can't determine a power differential from looking at the content. You often cannot even do it from looking at their profiles. So the impossibility of employing a traditional definition of bullying meant that Facebook had to make a choice. It could err on the side of keeping up potentially harmful and bullying content, or it could err on the side of removing all potential threats of bullying, even if some of the removed content turned out to be completely benign. And so faced with the intense pressure of these advocacy groups, media coverage on cyberbullying, and at the speed in which they were being asked to make the decisions based on the volume of the content reported, Facebook opted for the latter approach, but with a caveat. The new presumption in favor of taking down speech reported to be bullying would apply only to speech directed at private individuals. So this is a quote from one of the uh, authors of the policies. What we said was, look, if you can tell us this is about you and you don't like it, and you're a private individual, you're not a public figure, then we'll take it down. Because we can't know whether all the elements of bullying are met. We just had to make a call to create a default rule for the removal of bu bullying. Although this, he, although this author denies barring directly from First Amendment doctrine, public figure doctrine, the justification for creating this exception actually tracks the reason of Sullivan quite closely. And subsequent cases in treating certain targets of allegedly harmful speech differently on account of their public status and the public interest in their doings. Besides deciding how to quickly draw this line, though, I hope you kind of pulled out as lawyers or lawyers to be that there is an issue here, which is that they're still using this term public and private figure, which is undefined. So they had to figure out how to define quickly, again, to do this at scale, public and private figures. And does anyone have any guess what they did to try to determine how to do this? What? What do you think? Check mark. No, not check mark. Close, 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 very close. They decided to do this by running the people's names through Google News. So <laughs> to determine who is a public figure in order to decide whether or not to keep up the speech against bullying. This is like a whole other nest of things that after I write my first next 15 papers, I will someday re come back to this idea of the of like the cross use of platforms at these companies that they borrow each other's technology and services to provide their own product. But anyway, uh, for right now, developing separately from this idea of public figure, which again, as we said, was classified only to bullying, 
there was a related development in the idea of newsworthiness, and newsworthiness is an exception to everything on Facebook. So that means gore, that means nudity, that means hate speech. So that brings us to the story of the Boston Marathon bombing, and I've actually never given this talk in Boston before, so this is kind of um, a, like a little bit a little bit interesting to do. This is not the picture that I'm about to talk about, but at the time. Uh, uh, in 2013, um, after the Boston Marathon bombing, a graphic picture uh, was starting to circulate um, on Facebook. And the image in question was of a man in a wheelchair being wheeled away with one leg ripped open below the knee to reveal a long, bloody bone. And the picture had three versions. One was cropped so that the leg was not visible at all. And the second was a wide angle shot so that the leg was visible but less obvious. And the third and most controversial version clearly showed the man's insides on the outside, which is the content moderation term for how they define gore. If you can see insides on the outside, it gets taken down as gore. So despite being published in multiple media outlets, the site policy dictated that any links to the images or the images themselves, the third version of the picture, must come down. Philosophically, if we were going to take the position that insides on the outside was our definition of gore and we didn't allow gore, then just because it happened in Boston didn't change that, remembered one of the team members on call that day. Policy executives at Facebook, however, however disagreed and reinstated all such posts on the grounds of newsworthiness. So for some members of the policy team at Facebook who had spent years trying to create administratable rules, the imposition of such an exception seemed a radical departure from, some of the, from the company's commitment, at least in the realm of content moderation at the time, to procedural consistency. And it touches on, um, in his opinion for the court in Gertz, which Thomas didn't talk about, but is one of the intervening cases in public figure doctrine, Justice Lewis Powell worried openly about alleg al allowing judges to decide on an ad hoc basis which publications address issues of general or public interest and which do not. And similarly at Facebook, many worried that newsworthiness as a standard was extremely problematic. The question is really one of newsworthy to whom, and the answer to that is based on ideas of culture and popularity. The result, some feared, would be a mercurial exception that would privilege American users' views on newsworthiness to the potential detriment of Facebook's users in other countries. Great, so, so drawing those two parts together, uh, what Kate and I then do in the paper is look for some guiding lessons that both platforms and courts might be able to take out of this kind of a comparative analysis. And so looking carefully at the cases, we found that there were basically three different justifications or rationales behind the public figure doctrine that the courts developed, and then we tried to see how those cashed out in, uh, in the platform context. So why is it that you might have special rules for speech about public figures? Well, one rationale that the court frequently uh, talks about, um, is that uh, they have greater access to channels of counter speech, right? If somebody says something about you, especially if it's false or defamatory, and you're a public figure, you might think that you have greater access to the means to be able to rebut the lie. The harm against you maybe isn't quite so grave because you are able to access the mass media and say, that's false, here's why it's false, my reputation won't be as harmed as a, pub uh, sorry, as a private figure might be uh, given the same sort of speech. So there's this kind of access to, to channels of, of counter speech there. Um, the, the second idea is this one of sort of desert, of, of you are deserving of slightly harsher First Amendment rules. And again, this is this idea that is based on the concept of voluntariness. You have voluntarily put yourself in the public eye, and then as a result of that, you need to take along some of the lumps that you get uh, with that fame. Uh, and this is, you know, the court has talked about this as the sort of normative consideration underlying the public figure doctrine. Um, and as we'll sort of maybe talk about, especially in the question and answer, there's maybe some reason to, to question both of those justifications. You know, is it the case that public figures now have vastly superior uh, access to, to, to rebuttal? And is it the case that they're really more or less deserving of, uh, of harsher speech rules just by virtue of their fame. And then the third reason why you might ha have different rules for speech about public figures is just going into this idea of newsworthiness. Just by the fact that they are public figures, just by the fact that they have this really important role in our society, 
the stuff that they do is more likely to concern the public, it's more likely to be of interest to the public. So this idea of newsworthiness and matter of public concern can take on a few different valences and it's really important to kind of tease those out. But at its simplest level, you can think of it as a normative concept or, of a or as a descriptive concept, right? So if you're thinking about it as a normative concept, it's really the idea that it's a legitimate matter of public concern. It's something that the public should be concerned about. And this allows certain uh, considerations to creep in that say, well, the public may be really interested in this fact, but it's being prurient in being interested in this fact, or it's, it's invading somebody's privacy by being interested in this fact. It's going too far. It shouldn't be interested in this fact, even if it is. That's that sort of normative conception of a matter of public concern. But you might think that actually the correct standard should be a descriptive one. If the public is interested in it, as a matter of freedom of speech, then that is, is sufficient to say that it is a matter of public interest and it deserves uh, heightened protection. Who are the courts, for example, to be able to say what we as a public should or shouldn't be interested in? So with those kind of justifications in the background here, some of the issues raised by the way that Facebook is implementing its rules and setting its rules, I think become a little clearer. So one thing, for example, is the Google News issue that Kay just talked about, right? That is purely a descriptive con concept right, and, and kind of a, a haphazard one as well. So just by typing somebody's name into Google News, if it pops up and that makes you a public figure, there's nothing there that says anything about dessert, about whether you have voluntarily put yourself in the public eye. There's nothing there to necessarily say that you have more or less access to counter speech. There's really no nuance about it at all. And perhaps more problematic in the age of social media, you might be in that Google News search because you went viral on social media. And I think that leads us maybe to, to what Kate's going to talk about a little bit. Yeah, so this kind of gets into the idea of what I, we mentioned Gertz before, which is one of the cases that laid out, uh, took kind of from New York Times v. Sullivan, which was really about public officials, people running for government or already in government positions. And then Gertz kind of opened this idea up on, into this idea of there are different types of public figures. And there's a general purpose public figure, which is someone who is generally either a public official or has been in the limelight or has celebrity. There are limited purpose public figures. Figures, those are people who thrust themselves into the spotlight. And then in a footnote in Gertz, they mentioned there is also this idea of perhaps an involuntary public figure, but we're not going to define that or worry about that exactly right now. And the court has continued to not do that for many, many years. And what we argue is that uh, the internet has brought us, for the first time, the true involuntary public figure. Um, and previously, these were such a rare phenomenon in the physical world, and the court has only found them in a few instances that um, are usually about um, being a victim of crime or a perpetrator of a crime in some way. And so that brings me to the story, which I think is probably the best example I've ever found about a lack of voluntariness, which is Alex from Target. I do not know if any of you remember this. This was, uh, this was back in 2014. On November 2nd, 2014, an anonymous Twitter user tweeted a picture of a Target employee wearing a name tag Alex and bagging items behind the cashier. In the next 24 hours, the tweet gained over 1,000 retweets and 2,000 favorites. Over the next day, the hashtag Alex from Target was mentioned more than 1 million times on Twitter, while the keyword Alex from Target was searched over 200,000 times on Google. Shortly thereafter, Twitter users started an effort to de-anonymize the Alex in the photo. They were successful, and it resulted in the publication of his Twitter handle, at which time he amassed a quarter million followers. So jealous. <laughs> Two days later, he appeared on the television talk show, Ellen, that made me jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Death threats, denigrating posts, and fabricated stories about Alex from Target followed shortly thereafter, of course, because it's the internet. So it's hard to argue that Alex from Target, a global celebrity at this point, with hundreds of thousands of social media followers, is merely a private individual. Similarly, it is hard to argue that Alex from Target is a voluntary public figure who thrust himself into the vortex of a public issue by bagging groceries at his part-time job after school. Moreover, Alex from Target does not fall into one of the categories of involuntary public figures who have been established in case law thus far, though it's thin, people who have been victims of crimes or accused of committing crimes. And so we argue that the internet has eroded some of the traditional reasons for specially protecting speech concerning public figures based on the assumption that people become public figures by choice and that as public figures they have greater access to channels of rebuttal. And these assumptions are becoming increasingly outdated in the digital age given the dynamics of online virality and notoriety and given the ubiquity of channels for engaging in counter speech. And so 
I argue, we argue, voluntariness kind of has to go. And in its place, an idea that maybe has a more normative application, which is admittedly messy, but this idea of a sympathetic public figure. People we can't quite think of as private figures, given the celebrity that they have, but because of the nature of the speech directed at or about them, we want to make a different set of rules for. Um, and are we, do you want to? Yeah, I'll yeah. talk briefly. Well, actually, you so. You do the first two. Yeah, so, uh, well, so. The, the the next example we'll just go through these really we quickly. We have four so we, examples yeah. of like what what of a range of what might qualify as a sympathetic public figure. Yeah, we'll just put these on the table. Um, and so so this is Justine Sarko who put up this tweet and uh, it went viral as well. And by the time she, she 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 put this up right before she got on a flight, by the time she had landed in South Africa, there was a whole uh, kerfuffle about it. Uh, she was followed around on her vacation while she was in Africa. Uh, and, and lost her job and was you know, widely shamed as a result of this. So she is perhaps another example of somebody who may be voluntary public figure. She did something voluntary to put herself in the public limelight, but I don't think we can say that she reasonably assumed that her tweet was going to gain her this stardom. So anyway, put a, put a pin in that one. Uh, this uh, is the example of Adelia Rose. So she has a very, um, this is the, the child has a very rare condition that causes her to look like she's aging very prematurely. Her mother put up a Facebook page about her uh, as a way of raising awareness about Adelia's condition um, and so that people could keep up to date on her progress. And uh, horrifically, she was then the subject of all sorts of horrible conspiracy theories and hateful posts on social media about it. Um, again, can we really think of Adelia Rose as some sort of voluntary public figure, even though her guardian thrust her into the public eye in that way? Um, put, a, put a pin in that one as well. Covington Catholic Boys, another example. They were voluntarily in a public place protesting, engaging in core First Amendment activity, but then things went viral, and they are sort of taken out of the private figure realm and thrust into the public figure realm. Do we think that that's sort of fair? And then um, finally, gosh, I'm totally blanking on her name. Leslie uh, Jones. Leslie Jones, sorry, yeah. Leslie Jones, uh, who after um, the Ghostbusters remake came out, uh, was target of uh, horrible racial and sexist slurs on Twitter, causing her to leave. Uh, and she is a core public figure, right? Under any definition under First Amendment law, she's obviously a public figure. But does that mean that she should get, you know, different rules under Facebook? Recall that if she is a public figure under Facebook's rules, she can't uh, make use of the cyberbullying uh, protections under Facebook, at least as they were historically uh, defined. So I think that that's basically the core of our paper. The last part of our paper, I hope we can talk about um, with the panel, which is basically the idea that what we're trying to say that is an answer to a lot of these things is um, hopefully found in some, the Facebook's new oversight board or Facebook's Supreme Court, as it's sometimes called. This idea of establishing kind of rules and regulations and a set of norms and values that these content policies can be tied to and to borrow perhaps from what we know about institutions building uh, from, from the American courts and uh, American history and create something that uh, is much more responsive uh, to the freedom of expression that we want to have online. Can we put Zuck and his eagle up, please? Yeah, there we go. Good. <laughs> I just love that image. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I would like to invite the other three panelists to come up. Um, and so I'm hoping perhaps we could start. So I'll introduce our three amazing other panelists. And then I am hoping that perhaps Kate and Thomas can say a few words on the oversight board and what they were planning to kind of say about it in their presentation, and then we'll have reactions and comments from the other three. So the three panelists are, we have Kendra Albert, who's our clinical instructional fellow at the Cyber Law Clinic at Harvard Law School. Uh, they have a JD from HLS. They are interested in a really wide variety of issues across online speech, harassment, critical race, and feminist theories, gaming, and the list, the list goes on. They are currently a lecturer at HLS where they teach an advanced constitutional law class with Professor Martha Minow. Um, so yeah, Kendra Albert. Uh, Shinmai Arun is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center. 
or she worked specifically on the Berklet Cybersecurity Initiative. Uh, until recently, she was an assistant professor at National Law University in Delhi, uh, where she also founded and directed the Center for Communication Governance. Among her numerous interests are the regulation of speech online, platform governance, and questions of corporate social responsibility and digital rights in the global south. Uh, one of the, so I have a thought that I want to offer and put on the table for the panelists uh, as, you know, they offer comments and reactions, which is, so we, so the title of this talk and perhaps one of the reasons why many of you are here is this uh, notion of constitutionalizing speech platforms. And one of the questions I want to ask, or at least put in the back of our minds is, where are we using this language of constitutionalism? Does it matter, or does it make a difference, or should we just you know, do away with it? Yeah. There we go. Um, should I, I think I'm up first of the panelists, but maybe I should take a moment to introduce the last panelist uh, before, <laughs> before I get started. Uh, we need no introduction, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jay-Z, Jay-Z never needs an introduction I, in any context, whichever Jay-Z you're talking about. <laughs> so, I believe you have the I George should, I should, Professor of <laughs> International Law. I love right. how we're crowdsourcing I this. actually right. am... <laughs> I'm the word salad I mean, professor. Right. So <laughs> basically, basically, Jonathan Zertrain the needs no absolutely no introduction. <laughs> but I definitely had an introduction for him. And so the introduction is that Jonathan Zertrain is not only the George Bemis professor at, of international law at Harvard Law School. He is also a vice dean for. L L Library and Information Resources at HLS. He's the faculty director at the Berkman Klein Center and also a professor at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and at the Kennedy School. Waiting on the dental school, have not heard back yet. <laughs> but, it, but if Kendra wants to add something more, please go ahead. Um, no, I think, I'll, I'll, I, think, I think that's probably enough. Um, well, thank you, Electra, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Thomas and Kate, for the really like fascinating paper, which I, I feel like Electra was kind to me by saying how much uh, uh, ground my research covers, but I think y'all's paper covers almost as much ground. <laughs> so it was a challenge to figure out what specifically to think about or respond to, but sort of taking up a little bit of Electra's question. I think, um, you know, Y'all have picked a really difficult topic with the public figure doctrine, and as a Georgia district court judge said, in a published opinion, defining the public figure is, is as much like trying to nail a jellyfish to a wall, um, which I, like is at least a fascinating mental image. Um, and I think one of the challenges you encounter, and you sort of talk about at length, is how little SCOTUS has, like the Supreme Court of the US has actually said on this subject that's particularly useful to, um, uh, to Facebook in making its decisions to the extent that maybe they were based on a First Amendment framework, but also t to sort of other courts, lower courts, uh, policymakers, thinkers. And I think that sort of problem is the sort of same question I would have about the role of the Facebook Oversight Board or the Facebook Supreme Court, which is to say that I wonder about the framing of thinking that like Supreme Courts are the, are the best protectors of sort of these kinds of freedom of expression issues when so many of these decisions get made much lower in the system, whether by content moderators on the Facebook end or by judges, district court judges, state court judges in, in the in the uh, judicial one. And so one of the things I wanna sort of just throw out there, and I will honestly admit that I have not thought through it as thoroughly as I would like to before saying it on a public live stream, but you know, <laughs> I live, we live in the future. Um, so, which is to say you identify a number of sort of problems you want to solve, right? With this, things from like the lack of expertise and professional norms um, in sort of making these decisions that Google, the, the uh, Google News thing is just such an incredible factoid and a, a testament to the power of your research. The way powerful and connected people are more likely to get better treatment. And finally, and I think frankly most importantly, the failures of context, like the way in which the American centrism of the policy team, of the sort of, of the company, it makes a huge difference on who, how these rules are administered from everything from just like not knowing who's 
famous enough in countries that aren't the US, to things like language, where there's been widespread problems with Facebook not enforcing the rules equitably when they just don't have anyone who speaks a particular language. Google Translate being the other tool that they use uh, produced by Google and not an adequate substitute. So I think that takes me to my sort of provocative question, which is why a Supreme Court or an oversight board and why not a jury? You go ahead. Um, so I think that that's a really great point, and I think it depends very much on um, on a uh, on what it is that you exactly want this this thing to be doing, right? Whether it's a jury or an oversight board. So uh, I think that we write about, and one of the things that I felt strongest about is that I think that Facebook's actual um, its actual incentives align really well with creating an oversight board to jettison the hard job of creating public policies on what speech stays up or what speech comes down. Having an oversight board basically allows them to put, take off, separate the powers, take, like, jettison this responsibility, and if there's people, you know, are upset about something being um, taken down or something staying up, they have a, uh, they, Facebook can say, hey, listen, this isn't, we didn't, like, we didn't do this. We're just following the rules of this oversight board that has, ideally, all of this accountability and legitimacy and all of these other um, uh, norms of um, institutional building built in. Um, I think that falls apart as a concept, and I think, unfortunately, this is maybe where they're going, um, in reviewing content um, appeals decisions as like they generate from every user in the entire world um, not liking in a, like a content moderation decision on their behalf. I think that is not a good way to kind of like think of this oversight board and that things like ad hoc juries or something like that might be better means of kind of, of addressing that problem. But that's a split that like for some reason they're trying to figure out right now and I'm really unclear why they want to do the latter at all underneath the realm of, of the oversight board. Thank you. Um, I, I usually begin uh, most of my comments with Kendra as always, right? So I, I love the jury's idea and, and maybe what I'll do is I'll open with the Article 19 proposal for social media councils, which was also a part of David Kay's report when he suggested that Facebook might like to come up with a system like this. I just want to put it out there as a potential option to get more context. So usually when I'm on panels like this, um, I'm told that I'm here to be the international voice and I go, no, no, I can't speak for the whole world. But in this case, since Facebook has more users in India than anywhere else, I feel very comfortable doing this, <laughs> just saying. Um, I, I guess the, um, if, if you start thinking about this outside a US perspective, and I'm sorry, I know this is a little unfair because you've been comparing US law mainly to the to the Facebook Supreme Court, but the thing is that whatever they come up with applies across the world, um, and so people like, like me are worried about it. Facebook has already stated uh, that nothing that the Supreme Court does is going to go in opposition to government orders and to uh, court orders that, that emerge. Um, from from na nations. Uh, I, I noticed that alongside this, they've also said that the oversight board will be responsible to the users of the platform. And I just want to flag, I mean, um, just, just so we put it out there, that sometimes the interests of the users of the platforms can be at tension with what mm -hmm. their governments want. Mm -hmm. It's interesting also that, they, uh, that they've set up this board in part um, to respond to, criti to criticisms about what they did in Myanmar. And I wonder whether a policy like this is likely to address uh, situations like Myanmar. Small country, not, not a whole lot of users. And then it takes us back to the question of who offers context, because the government is, is putting one narrative out there, and you would have to talk to juries or to social media councils to access a different narrative. And, and that would, of course, raise questions of where do you find people that are independent and fearless enough to tell you what you need to know. Um, the third thing, it's, it's unrelated, um, I, I guess, to my first two points, un unless you look at it again as a context question. So one of the things that I loved about your paper is that you opened with uh, cyberbullying, which you also introduced mm -hmm. here. So it's interesting, when, when India had its wave of, um, of the Me Too, um, I, I don't want to say allegations because it's a judgmental word, but Me Too narratives, uh, there was a list, it was called the list of sexual harassers in academia that, that was put up on Facebook by a young woman called Raya Sarkar. And that list was removed for cyberbullying. The shitty men in media list? 
No, no, shitty men different. in media is different. This okay. is shitty men in academia. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> They're everywhere. Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so the list goes down for cyberbullying, right? Um, and it's, it's not clear to me what standard they used, whether it was newsfeed or whether they just sort of felt instinctively that this was cyberbullying. I'm, I'm again putting it out there to suggest that, that these issues are complicated. To Facebook's credit, the list went back online in a couple of days, but it was because the people sort of advocating for the list were able to access Facebook. Um, I, yeah, I, I have one more comment to offer on your paper that has nothing to do with context. It, maybe it's a question, not a comment, which is that when, when Facebook deals with newsfeed and in trying to identify who is a public figure and who is not, is it just sort of a let us stroll the newsfeed and see how many hits we get? Or is it an intelligent classification of are people showing up on government websites? Are there some sources, do you think, that Facebook flags as sort of more significant in identifying a public figure? Because if it were to do so, I think that it, the involunt involuntary public figure problem might um, diminish a little. Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can speak a little bit to that. So um, uh, the truth is that we don't really know uh, uh, the inside workings of some of those newsworthiness determinations. And that is in part why Kate and I are bullish in part on the idea of creating this sort of oversight board that will bring about both more transparency and also hopefully some idea of uh, attempting to create uh, uh, continuity, right? Some idea of stare decisis almost borrowing, again, from American law, but that's not an American only concept, uh, is this idea that we don't know what's going on behind these closed doors, and they are often made by high level policymakers. Uh, and if, uh, as part of this oversight board, there will be reasoned decisions that will be published, we think that that is a step in the right direction. Will it solve all of the problems that you said? No, absolutely not, but I think that it is a step in the right direction. Your point about the different laws, uh, obviously hugely concerning to, to us as well. Um, I am becoming increasingly pessimistic on this point that we can have a global internet, particularly global speech platforms that do have these global policies. Facebook is so dead set on sticking to this line. We are a global community, we are a global community. Um, but I think at some point we really need to ask the hard question of whether that's possible or desirable um, in practice, even if maybe in theory it might be. There are plenty of circumstances in which the internet is not this borderless world in which uh, some of the founders maybe thought that it was going to be. And I am no longer convinced that that is like a bad thing. I think that there may be times where we do need to have uh, region-specific policies, uh, things that are in place to either protect users more or to uh, you know, respect certain local laws or customs. Uh, and newsworthiness is one of those really delicate areas. Now, will Facebook ever you know, create that kind of a system where it says, all right, we'll apply European privacy and free speech law in Europe and American? And you know, I, I don't see them doing that, at least uh, not uh, unless they're sort of dragged into it kicking and screaming. Uh, but I do think that there are some of these times where we, where we, we may want to push for that kind of nuance, uh, depending on, on localization. And then the last thing I just say, which goes a little bit back to Kendra's question, uh, on the jury's point, since, since you brought it up as well, uh, we were at a, a, a conference a couple of days ago um, at Yale where there was uh, somebody from Harvard who was presenting their jury paper. Jenny Fan. Uh, Jenny Fan, um, this idea of juries for, for social media. And um, I asked her this question, and I feel like you could have easily asked it to us as well about our paper, or I made this comment, I should say, which is that when it comes to matters of content moderation, I think we do ourselves a disservice and we don't get as much analytical purchase if we ask at too high a level of generality about will X solve content moderation or will Y be the response to this issue in content moderation? Because so much is gonna depend on the type of content moderation that we're talking about. So will algorithms fix content moderation? Like I, I didn't even know how to begin answering that question. But will hashing databases be a really good way to make sure that copyright violating material goes down? Maybe, well then let's talk about that. You know, pr probably not, but let, you know, let's at least talk about it on that level of nuance. I'm biting my tongue. Yeah, no, no, sorry. It was a rhetorical question not meant to suggest that I agree with it. Um, but, you know, uh, but, but then will, you know, will AI be used to make newsworthiness determinations? No, it absolutely can't be. This requires some sort of human nuanced review that, uh, th that I think at least, if we're gonna have a sort of a sensible concept of newsworthiness, we're probably not gonna be able to do that through AI. So uh, just as, as you ask, you know, whether juries are the right response uh, or whether courts are the right response, I think sometimes court-like court institutions might be the right response and sometimes juries might be, and we may start getting into a world in content moderation similar to the legal system where we have sort of 
questions of facts determined by juries and questions of law determined by judges. I, I, again, I'm not saying that I'm advocating for that, but I think that that might be the way in which we're, we're heading. Well, I think it's um, kind of entirely fitting that this session is taking place under this meme-tastic churrasco of um, Mark looking right out at us, uh, Sam the Eagle kind of distracted, looking at something else, and um, a kind of conflation of new and old, which is, of course, what your paper is about. And I think that's kind of the question for us is, how much is really new here? And I think you're making the case that a lot of it is new and different. And then, as you're asking the question of, well, how do we process that? It's really hard not to process it without reference to touch points that we can say, well, we at least all used to agree on this. Is there some way to import whatever this is to the present circumstance? And there's great value in that without wanting to fall victim to status quoism, where you just say, well, this is the way it was. This is the way it has to be. Um, I find myself both hearing from a lot of people and inhabiting myself um, the contradiction of in the scandal of the week with Facebook. And I, I don't know what this week's is. It's only Monday, but we'll find out shortly. Um, it's Tuesday. Oh. Well, then do we know what the scandal is? No. Okay. That's why I thought it was Monday. Um, and uh, in that... Uh, in myself and in others, on the one hand, there's the, darn it, why don't these companies take responsibility for what's happening on their platforms? They're just turning a blind eye to things and still cashing in on the value of the platforms. They need to own what's happening, which, you know, sounds kind of right. And on the other hand, it's also SMH, look what Facebook just did. <laughs> Here they are throwing around their weight unaccountably. And then Facebook's like, let's have an external advisory board that we're bound by. They're like, look at the way that they're externalizing their responsibility. Why can't they just own what? And all of those seem right, and they don't seem commensurable. And uh, I think it's part of the challenge for us to work that stuff through. And just a couple ideas on that front are, first, to get straight at which moment we're bringing to bear which framework on harmful, undesirable speech, which is what we've been focusing on here. Is it, one, a public health framework? This stuff is, quote unquote, viral. It can infect you. If you are exposed to it, you could become radicalized. Once you're radicalized, exposing you to non-radical speech does not tend to cure you. So it's a one-way function. That If you have that mindset, that's going to cascade into a bunch of priorities and recommendations and decisions about things. So it's worth owning that mindset if that's where you're at. Another mindset is the rights mindset. It just says there are certain utterances that by the fact of their utterance deprive people of dignity and therefore should not be uttered. And even if they don't hear it, maybe, they are being deprived of dignity. That's different, I think, from the public health mindset. And of course, the rights mindset also includes the right to speak and figuring out, uh, reading Article 19, which one is supposed to win uh, can be its own trick. Um, and a third is what you call a legitimacy framework, which is to say, I don't know what the substantive rule is, but so long as it was decided in a way that I respect, I can abide the decision without having to substitute my judgment for it, which is where we start saying, well, let's have a jury deal with this. Let's constitutionalize it and point to this body of rules that's evolved in the American framework that at least within America should be the way to do it. And after all, the justices decided, and they're non partisan. Um, so uh, those are three frameworks that might help us figure out our contradictions and see what strands we're drawing from what. Um, now just a, maybe three or four uh, as each a sentence, um, issues that I find myself working through that also to me reemphasize how new and different this area potentially is. One is it's easy and tempting to think of this just as in like the constitutional law cases, what gets banned and what gets allowed. That's what they're saying the basis of the Facebook Supreme Court will be. But there's also, well, what will the thumb on the scale be about? And Mark has embraced this idea. He points to this really cool graph of as speech on Facebook tends to be nearer the line of something they would ban, but still short of it, 
people get more enthusiastic about seeing it and sharing it. So it's like, yay, wow, oh boy. And then as soon as it crosses the line, we delete it, and it drops to zero in exposure. And that seemed weird to him, and his thought was, maybe it should be a graceful decline. <laughs> as you get closer to the line, fewer and fewer people can see it, even though it's not banned. Uh, this is the shadow banning mm -hmm. that people get nervous about. And of course, there may be some speech whose value is precisely in that it is close to the line. Just ask Lenny Bruce, who crossed it many times. Um, and yet, that is a way of saying there's a whole bunch of decisions around what to promote, what to push down. Is there a baseline level of virality? That starts to get into the mechanics of whatever uh, framework there is, for which my reaction tends to be there shouldn't just be one framework. How do we blow that up so that no one entity has responsibility on that curational point? A second thing is whether or not these decisions should apply to private messaging. It's one thing to say it's a public post, all right, people don't like it, let's take it down or let's put a thumb on the scale. But how about just a communication as we're planning the panel? If as we're planning the panel, we should violate the Facebook terms of service in our private messaging, should Facebook be able to notice that and take action upon it? Facebook's answer, I think, through uh, their content lead is yes, our terms of service apply everywhere. That is unusual to us. I think that triggers our status quo warnings. A third thing would be, um, Ways in which the introduction of chance and fortuity might be helpful. When we have close calls on an issue between people who can't agree, sometimes the way to agree is to flip a coin. And then the outcome, so long as it's an honest coin, is accepted by both parties. And sometimes litigation is seen that way as well. <laughs> but Juries. Uh, yeah, or juries. And, uh, that's strange. I think we live in an era where we crave more certainty, more information, and we are offered by the tools, and by we, I think I mean Facebook, um, opportunities for intervention and control that are nearly unprecedented. And the constitutional law cases can't really reflect that because most unauthorized gatherings and demonstrations on the Cambridge Common do not have immediately apparating police officers that disperse the crowd. It has to hit a certain threshold before it even draws public attention, which is part of the framework by necessity. The algorithmicization of things effectively makes it so that every possible interaction can be subject to the rule. Uh, I guess there was a neat conference just last weekend at Yale on perfect enforcement, which I'm sorry to miss, but I hope this was discussed mm -hmm. fulsomely there. And um, it gets into the human versus algorithm uh, kind of debates that we're having. I might be more willing to let the algorithm decide if it is simple, even though simplicity makes it wrong in corner cases, and if it has elements of randomness at time that kind of mean you're not always going to win, but there's not going to be a consistent bias either uh, in the most directive ways. Um, that kind of embrace of chance might be a way of trying to disperse power in the ultimate way, given that we have a surfeit of it and we don't trust anybody uh, to exercise it well. And I recognize what a contradiction that even is, but I think it's one we should inhabit. And the very last point is, I wonder how much these discussions would be made simpler if the act of physically threatening someone, not imminently, but it's like, I don't know how much better I should feel if they're like, I'm coming to kill you and I won't tell you when. <laughs> it's like, uh, is that imminent? I don't, please give me more detail so I know if you're wronging me. It seems wrong. Um, but if in fact there were real world consequences for the act of credibly physically threatening somebody, maybe that would alter the stakes and complications of this conversation. Because it does seem to me that if you do that, and the opportunities to do that are so much more legion than they were before this world came about, it might mean there was an externalization of pressure on that front um, that traditional law enforcement would know how to handle if it had the resources to do it in the right uh, jurisdictions and environments. Do you want to respond? Oh, and the uh, uh, question is, what do you think of that? Yeah. <laughs> I do, but uh, do you want to um, go ahead? 
Um, I'll just say one brief thing in response to one of your like incredibly rich comments. I really, really appreciate all of those. Um, just on the uh, on the issue of sort of downranking and issues like that, I think that going back to Electra's initial question about is it helpful to think about this as, like, as constitutionalizing and is it helpful to think about this as courts is an area where I agree with you it could be problematic, particularly if we have an Anglo-American conception of courts, and a particularly American one, of dealing with cases and controversies. And Evelyn Dueck, who I don't know if she's here, there she is, uh, who I haven't met yet, but I'm excited to meet you, uh, just sent me her amazing paper on the Facebook oversight board, and she makes this exact wonderful point about how if we look at it just in terms of sort of case resolution, uh, or a dispute about harmful speech, then we might miss some of these more sort of systemic issues um, that don't lend themselves to that kind of framework. And that's where I would agree that maybe constitutionalizing or courts-based thinking is not the right way to think about it. So it's a, it's a really great point, um, and her paper is amazing. Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I, I everything that you said, but especially at the beginning when you're kind of talking about what it is that we demand out of Facebook and then what it is that we kind of, uh, and then how we flip back and forth on this. So I, I really actually, I'm writing a, a piece right now um, for, uh, a magazine that uh, I was given access to the 48-hour uh, team that took down the was in charge of taking down the Christchurch shooting video, and um, it is this global follow the sun escalations team around how to do it. And what I think is super interesting about all of this, uh, and researching this, and a few few weeks ago. Um, Casey Newton at The Verge had published something also about um, the content, the, the the disgustingness of like the content moderation work of like of people having to look through these terrible pictures and these this terrible content, and what I think is fascinating about these all of these ideas is Facebook always gets such li such like vitriol at them for like not taking this down, not taking responsibility for their platform, and I agree with like most of that. There has to be these content moderation policies. But what I actually think people are very upset about is that like this type of content exists and the frictionless of the internet and platforms shows it to us. And it's like, people have always sucked this much and we just didn't know about it. And it's just, I think- A that, heartening thought. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> is I, it? I know, but, but I mean, but I, I really do think that there is that there is a there is a tight there is a level at which, and I don't think it's being talked about nearly enough because I think it's very easy to blame a big corporation. That there are like plenty of people working at Facebook who are trying so hard to take down harmful content to do this every single day, and there are terrible people putting this stuff back up and thwarting the system at every single moment and. It's just kind of, um, it's just like figuring out like the right, um, the right place to put the blame, the right button to push at the right point in the system is like, I think half the battle here. Okay, so I would have thousands of questions for the panelists, but I want to give a chance to the audience to ask questions. We, we have, have 40 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually have another 15 minutes for those who can stay with us, uh, so yep. Are there mics? Um, thank you, this was a great discussion. So the uh, name of this event was Constitutionalizing Speech Platforms, plural. And I think it's <laughs> telling that we've mostly been talking about one platform, Facebook. And you know, Facebook is big and powerful and rich and they can afford to have this new Supreme Court and you know, an army of lawyers and an army of poorly paid people to look at traumatizing videos all day long and take them down. But how does what we've been talking about so far translate to, you know, for example, my fountain pen Slack group, which has several thousand users, but is ultimately <laughs> run by like one guy in his spare time on no money. Or alternatively, the, the next CS undergrad who's going to start the next Facebook killer with a team of like, you know, five to 10 people, but maybe millions or billions of users? I, for my part, I think it may be beneficial to think of a system that's mainstream and marginal, knowing that the marginal today can become tomorrow's mainstream, and to expect or hope for, however it might come about, a very different set of practices and overhead to implement them depending on where they are. Like, I remember Goatsy, and uh, 
I was not a frequent visitor to that site. If you haven't heard of it, I don't recommend that you type those letters into your browser. Um, but the idea that you would expect every site to have the kind of uh, effort that we are describing for a Facebook, and maybe it's the Facebook. There's not a lot of them. Maybe it's Twitter, too. Um, it used to be the Facebook. It used to be the Facebook, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, that's, that maybe is an unevenness that is desirable and would call to mind the idea that if you're wanting to go off-roading, you should. And, and talking about the way that uh, I think it was uh, Kate was just saying how these videos are suddenly so ubiquitous, if they get offered to your two-year-old toddler after three Thomas the Tanks engines and then suddenly it's like, here's a murder, like that's a problem for a mainstream platform, and if you have to go in search of it, and it's at paste bin or something, maybe that's okay. I don't know if that's okay from the public health model, but it's okay maybe more from the rights model uh, or from the legitimacy model. So that it may help that unevenness as a feature rather than a bug. Um, I, I guess I wanna just offer a brief uh, answer, which is to say I don't think you've heard probably any of us say that we think that any of the stuff that we're talking about should be legally required. So that's like maybe a useful sort of uh, uh, baseline point. But I also think one thing that happens when we talk about like small communities or non, not Facebook, not Twitter, is folks often underestimate the degree into which these problems are also common to them. Yes, certainly you don't have, I think, the same kind of like, oh, we need our round, like follow the sun 48 hour team to get the Christchurch video taken down. But I will say that if you have a, a couple thousand person Slack and you don't have any moderators, you actually do have a content moderation problem. You may not know about it. <laughs> um, so I think that one of the problems perpetually is that these these conversations do take place in terms of these large platforms thanks to fantastic work by people like Kate and Thomas. But I also think it is partially because we devalue this work on how it creates smaller platforms that means that we don't think that the smaller platforms need the same thing. In quote, the real world, uh, juries are made of involuntary draftees and we specifically don't want juries that are made up of people who volunteer to be on juries. How does that uh, translate to the online world if you propose to have juries? Um, so this one's my fault, but I want to actually, uh, <laughs> Chimayi, you had a response to the last one. Do you want, you sure? Okay, so I guess um, spinning out the hypothetical a little bit, I think that what might be useful to think about is that um, it, oh. Well, thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> no, Mark is just controlling the lights. That's just a thumb on the scale. The you is... can still hear the speech, you just can't <laughs> see it. I mean, I don't see any reason why. I think that you could do involuntary juries in the same way on Facebook as you do in the real life. Um, and I think that the reason that's appealing to me, which I think, and I'll stop there because this is not about my jury theory, um, <laughs> is to say that it does help with some of the problems of context and sort of uh, that I think are a major problem with content moderation because you can actually theoretically at least pick Facebook users who are um, it, from a particular country or from a particular place or ha maybe even have had particular experiences. Um, and f the, the unfortunate fact is that's facilitated by the amount of ga ga data that Facebook gathers about us, but you know, we'll set that aside. Um, so I think that is what could be appealing about it. Imagining voir dire for a Facebook jury. <laughs> <laughs> I object to this yeah. dog being on the jury. <laughs> Hi, um, when we talk about using algorithms or AI versus humans to do content moderation, has there been any data um, about how successful the algorithms or AI is versus human judgment? I mean, I know we hear anecdotes about when the algorithm fails, but you know, I think a good comparison is even if the AI or algorithm does have these failures, what is their success rate versus like human content moderation? Yeah, so I think that there's, I'll just kind of some basic uh, some basic stuff about AI and algorithms in the moderation process. There pretty much is none. <laughs> it's actually all uh, in about like 
95% of it is, uh, is done by uh, uh, humans uh, making decisions after they're flagged by other humans as being problematic. There is an automatic process that takes place in the uploading of any video or photographic content in which um, that photo is uh, is checked against a hash database, which is like a digital fingerprint. I mean, like a, if in the child pornography um, realm and a database that is uh, maintained by NCMEC, uh, which is basically keeps all of the, um, has hashes for all of the known child pornography in the universe. And what I want to say about that is that it's not an algorithm, it is just a one-to-one -one matching system. Like, right? So that's like, it's not doing anything super intelligent. It's just one-to-one -one matching. Um, and it's not machine learning. It's not anything else. Um, and the same thing is used for terrorist content now. It's also used for copyrighted content. Um, content ID is YouTube's proprietary thing for this. Um, but I think that uh, your question is basically like, how do we account for AI kind of not fitting in the system? One of the things about the Christchurch shooting is that um, humans figured out a way around the hash system. And what happened was that Facebook was putting all of these new hashes on these videos that were coming up and people at 8chan were taking the video, flipping it around, fuzzing it up, get, finding ways to like, like trick, the, trick the system into identifying the video. And so it's almost kind of like the human in the loop was like specifically trying to screw all the other humans in the loop. It was a very, it's kind of, it was just a mess. So does that answer your question? Okay. If I could just add something briefly onto that. So at least if Facebook's own figures that they release are to be believed, uh, it's really interesting to look at the differences between the different types of content and how they're catching things. So it will probably not surprise you to learn that in the copyright context and the child pornography context and some of these ones that Kate was just talking about where there's hashing, Facebook claims, you know, upwards of 95, 98% success rate. They don't actually release the, the how they're doing that or like how they know that it's 98% or 95%, which is a huge problem. Sorry. Yeah, to no, totally. Um, but, you know, again, uh, assuming that we, we believe them or that we think that there's something there, at the very least they're admitting that compared to other types of content, this is at least easier for them to grab. And then you look at things like hate speech and cyberbullying, and that's in the like 40 to 55% range. Um, and of course, why is that? Well, because context is so often much more important in issues related to hate speech and bullying. There's the power differential point that we talked about earlier in the paper for cyberbullying. And with hate speech, uh, one of the main problems that comes up there is coded language. Uh, when it comes to some of these, uh, th th this forms of speech, uh, there was a really fascinating study that uh, I saw come out of a couple of Brazilian scholars, I think it was about a year ago, where they looked at uh, uh, the fact that when it came to white supremacists, uh, words that we would traditionally associate with things like love and care were more common among white supremacist users than non-white supremacist users. Um, and so trying to come up with some sort of detection mechanism that flags you know, bad words that could give some sort of advance notice to that type of speech is gonna be really difficult. You would need to constantly be updating it. There would be so many false positives if it was just to be done without uh, human review that it makes it really difficult to think of a content moderation system that could, that could rely on that uh, sensibly. Just drags it away a little bit from your question, but I just wanted to add a postscript to what you're saying. Um, is that sometimes context can can work in a different way. So Facebook never used to code caste into race, and so so to sort of capture caste, all all it needed was diversifying their content team, and they finally started accepting it as as racially charged speech. Yeah. I have the mic over here. Does that mean I get to? Yeah. So, uh, so thank you all for the for the wonderful, wonderful panel. You're like a super group up there. Um, my my question is whether um, we're looking for procedural solutions to what are substantive and logistical issues, as, uh, as if looking for the keys under the street lamp. So the logistical issue that you're all aware of is that to effectively mine the store would mean dramatically increasing the number of, matter, of moderators and the expertise that they had to who knows what the levels would be. And the substantive issue being that to define speech standards across billions of users across different cultures, there's not a right answer to that. You know, we can lift up the hood and look at that, but there's not a right answer. 
Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, something that Kate and I are quite firm on in the paper is to call out Zuckerberg for one of his, I, I think it was probably just a slip. When he speaks extemporaneously, I love it because it gives us lots of things to talk and sort of criticize him about, but I don't think he probably meant this. But he initially, when he talked about the, the oversight board, he said, this is a board that's gonna be able to define global norms. We're so excited about that. It's like, good luck. Like, that, you know, they don't exist and no board that you create could create them. Um, and, and I think that's exactly right. You know trying to separate out what it is that procedural mechanisms like this can do uh, in reality is, is, is really important. And so when it comes to, you know, are we looking for, for, for the wrong thing? Well, you know, we can be looking for different things. One thing that Facebook might do through this board is not find global norms, but at least set standards by which its own community standards might be judged against. So it's talking about when it does finally create this board, it's gonna issue a charter. And in this charter are gonna be certain Facebook fundamental rights. At the moment, they're just a bunch of buzzwords, due process, equality, stuff like that. But presumably, if it's going to be worth anything at all, they're going to add a little more meat to the bone there. And then we might, we're not going to get global norms, but we are going to get a sense of what Facebook's values are and the values by which its own content moderation or its own community standards are going to be judged. That is something that will have a huge substantive effect beyond any sort of procedure, whether they're the right rules or not. Again, that's, that, that's a question. That's what we need to sort of hold them accountable for. But it's, uh, it's definitely a part of this story. Hi, uh, I have two questions. I'll pick one and we'll see if we have time for the second one later. Um, so this is uh, great that we were just talking about global norms because that's the general area where my question comes from. So Facebook, uh, Twitter, most of these uh, bigger content companies that we're talking about are based here at the moment. And like we said, Facebook is not in a position to create these global norms. But there is very clearly a need for similar kind of regulation in different parts of the world. And I know you don't want to be the inter international expert here, <laughs> but you know exactly what I'm ta talking about. So is, I have to say that I don't have any background in law at all. I'm a computer scientist, so this, this is a question rooted in ignorance, definitely. Is there any precedent of different contexts or domains where a company, if they are a company or like a private entity, if they are not in a position to protect their users in a certain geographical area or in a certain context, maybe they shouldn't be allowed to operate in that context or in that area. Is there any precedent, um, I, I don't know, pharmaceuticals come to mind or uh, clinical um, domains come to mind. So do, you, do any of you have any insights about where we could look for some guidance and insight maybe? That's, that's a question that I've been trying very hard to answer with this paper I'm writing, and it's not going well, <laughs> let me just say. Um, I, I, I think that if you were think, to think of it in the context of technology companies, it wasn't law really, but sort of public shaming uh, Google withdrew from China. Uh, and, and that sort of triggered, um, I, I guess, a global network initiative and other quests for global norms. The US used to have, and I will leave it to the toddler professor to, to explain it uh, in, in more detail. Sorry, Jonathan. Uh, but the, the, the US used to have um, ACTA, which, which uh, intervened when US companies were engaged in um, engaged in certain kinds of human rights violations around the world. I haven't reviewed the case law in enough detail to comment, but as far as I've gone, it appears that that would not blame the, uh, the social media companies if they were actively um, harming citizens in other countries. So I, I agree with you that it's, it, it is a worrying problem, and I think that those of us who are from countries in which we have seen the scale at which human rights violations can be enabled by social media platforms tend to focus on that more. Uh, but it's not looking good so far, is, is my short and optimistic answer. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't expect help from like the Alien Tort Claims Act, uh, but it's interesting when we, again, think of platforms that aren't the classic Facebook or Twitter or any uh, kind of public posting, but like, you know, WhatsApp, where you have private groups and things getting forwarded, and that leads to rumors spreading. It was interesting to me to see both a pivot by Facebook more towards encrypted private group messaging where you don't have the platform in a position to, to know what's going on directly or to be monitoring algorithmically. Uh, and that's something typically that in our quarters has been celebrated, the ability to communicate securely. Um, and then uh, to see the imposition on top of that of, but we're going to put on a limit of five forwards of something 
for everybody. You only can forward. And after the fifth time, it expires. It crumbles into dust like a book <laughs> that's been lent out too many times. It's interesting to see a rule as crude and comprehensive as that as some way of trying to respond to the problem of virality on a network like that. OK, I actually want to use the last 30 seconds to ask one of my questions, but you can feel free not to answer. And this uh, follows up slightly on what Jay-Z was talking about on the graph that kind of goes down, so the progressive yeah. content removals. And also to Rob's question about focusing on process rather than substance. Um, and so one of the arguments I've heard recently was, oh, if you actually deal with the business model, if you deal with the data and the attention economy problems, you actually will engineer away all of the speech issues. And I'm not sure that's a good answer, but I wonder what you might think about that and what does that tell us about what are the specific speech harms that need to be tackled outside of this more economic framework. Uh, we don't. <laughs> OK. No, it won't solve it. <laughs> but it does, I mean, it does get to questions of concentration of private power. And to the extent that that economy is powered by personal information, and that in turn allows for ad syndication networks where you could have quite an extensive dossier by a Facebook without ever having visited facebook.com or set up an account there. Um, thinking about ways to diversify that so that advertisers have other choices about where to try to place their ads and have a hope at targeting them to the advertiser's satisfaction, I think would absolutely have all sorts of second and third order effects on the ability to intervene regulatorily or quasi-regulatorily, which is sort of the whole paper, um, in patterns of speech. So uh, that alone would surely have a huge and maybe salutary impact. I'd hate to try to predict it uh, from afar. OK, thank you very much to our five panelists. And thank you, Electra.